Amen. Amen. Well, uh, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Hebrews chapter 11. That's where we've been the last few weeks. Uh, Pastor Buddy opened up talking about, uh, kind of answering the question, what is faith? And we talked about Abel. We talked about Enoch, which uh, Matt Galloway talked about uh, last week. And so today we will be um, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 talking about Noah. Um, Enoch last week got four total verses in the Bible, um, and Noah gets four chapters. Uh, And so he's actually the great-grandson of Enoch, and so uh, we'll see how this family line uh, continues to be people of faith. Um, But before we dive into Noah's story, what I want to do is I want to read off some statistics for you um, in regards to faith uh, in our country and kind of where we're at. And here's uh, a couple of statistics. Approximately 90% of Americans say they believe in God or some other higher power. And these people might be called people of faith. Uh, Of that 90%, 56% say they believe in the God of the Bible. The other 33% of that 90% say they believe in some other higher power, but not necessarily the God of the Bible. And that leaves roughly 10% um, of Americans that say they do not believe in God or any other higher power. Um, These maybe identify themselves as atheists, agnostic, um, or religious nuns, um, not like nuns, but N-O-N-E-S, no religion at all. But here's a few points I want to make uh, from these statistics. Number one, that that number of 10% um, of people who claim to be no faith uh, is an increasing number um, in our country. Uh, Number two, if 56 Six percent of our country says they believe in the God of the Bible. They have faith in the God of the Bible. Shouldn't things look a little bit different in our culture? Shouldn't things look a little bit different? Shouldn't we see a wave uh, in our culture moving towards the Lord if over 50 percent of our country truly believed and followed in faith um, after God? But instead, we see kind of a turn away from from biblical ideology. We've seen a turn away from the Bible. We've seen kind of a move towards things that are anti-biblical instead. And uh, we need to get that back in track. And if 56% of people truly exercise faith, the question is, would would we see that shift in the right direction? And then the 10% of Americans that say they don't believe in God or any other higher power, I would still say are people of faith. And here's what I, here's what I mean by that. Uh, many of these people would claim that what they believe is that uh, the Big Bang happened. Um, they would say science is what determines their beliefs. Um, and they would say the Big Bang happened. That's how we got uh, everything here. That's how everything was created in a sense. Um, evolution was the path for life. It's how we got here. Um, and what I would say is, well, you're exercising faith in that right? You're exercising faith in something you've never seen, Um, just like we exercise faith. We didn't watch God create, but we see what we have. We see God's creation. The Bible says we see God's creative abilities and his work and his power, um, and ultimately we know um, that he is real and true. So these people, I believe, are people of faith, but it's a worldly type of faith. It's a worldly type of faith that only sees, um, only has faith in past events, things that have happened in the past, um, which I would say as Christians, we exercise events that have happened in the past as well. The, the creation of the world, um, belief in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. These are all past events that we believe in. Um, but biblical faith, biblical faith calls us to have faith in these past events, but biblical faith is not only to believe in something that happened in the past, but to have hope in what is to come in the future and to live in accordance with that hope. Biblical faith, in other words, and what we're going to talk about tonight is biblical faith is faith in action. It is faith in action. And what we see in Hebrews chapter 11 is a a people who are of great biblical faith. And what I, what I find uh, kind of cool about Hebrews 11 is that if you see the title above uh, the chapter, it, it should say, by faith, uh, I think is what it probably says in most of your Bible, it says, by faith above it. Uh, and this is, this is a perfect example. I think it could also be called, the chapter could be called Faith in Action. Um, because what you see is it doesn't say uh, Abel had faith or uh, Enoch had faith or Abraham had faith or Noah had faith. Instead, what it says is, by faith, Noah, and then it proceeds on. By faith, Abel did this. By faith, Enoch did this. And what happens, what follows this by faith is action. What follows the by faith is action. So by faith, Noah 
put his faith into action. And we'll see uh, how he did that tonight. So Hebrews chapter 11 uh, in, will really be in verse 7 is the, is the verse that Noah gets um, in Hebrews 11. And we'll kind of unpack this verse um, and Noah's story as well. So Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 says this. It says, by faith, Noah, and let's stop right there for just a second, kind of answer this question, what is faith? Uh, what is faith? And the answer to that is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, if you f- just look back just a little bit, six verses back, it, it defines faith like this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So what faith is, is it's firmly trusting in something even when we can't see it. Or we could say that faith is confidence in the words of God even when we may have not yet seen the outcome of his words. I'll say that again. Faith is confidence in the words of God, even when we may have not yet seen the outcome of his words. He goes on to say in verse 7 about Noah's faith, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, And this word unseen kind of points us back to uh, verse 1 where it says that, uh, that faith is the conviction of things not seen, right? So unseen, not seen. We have this idea of things not being seen, but it's exercising this belief, this trust, this confidence uh, in it. And so Noah is called by God. Think about what Noah had not seen real quick. Noah had never seen a flood. Noah had no, there's no reason uh, for Noah to, if God's saying, hey, it's, uh, by the way, I'm about to send a flood, Noah would be like, what's a flood? What is, what is this? Uh, also, Noah had never actually seen rain. It had not rained yet. And so Noah's, Noah's thinking, okay, what, what exactly is about to happen here? Um, and we find out in Noah's story, which you'll find back in Genesis chapter 6 uh, through 10, uh, you'll see Noah's story. And it's rain comes, floods the earth because of the sin of humanity and the wickedness uh, of the hearts of man. God sends a flood. He wipes out um, the, the entire uh, earth population, animals, but he saves just a small, um, small family, and that is Noah's family. And think about this for just a second. If you were Noah and, you know, the, the waters recede, you get off the boat, um, you know, you're, you're good now, everything's good, you're off the boat, the flood's over, um, and then the next rain happens. What do you do with the next rain? I'll tell you what I'm doing. Animals, people, family, we're loading up. Let's go back up the mountain, hop on the boat, um, because it's raining again. It's about to flood. I know God promised um, that this wouldn't happen, and it never says this. So Noah obviously was a man of faith. He trusted what God said, that he wouldn't send a flood like this again. But I'm telling you, I think if it was me, I'm probably hopping back on the boat at the next rainstorm. I see a cloud. Oh, yeah, we need to get on the boat uh, for the floods are about to come again. But my wife and kids, I'm sure, would laugh at me as I run up the mountain uh, to the boat on the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. Uh, rainstorm. But what Noah's faith was, it was not solely relegated to past events. Not solely relegated to past events, like what's mentioned in Hebrews 11, 11, 3. Verse 3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So Noah believed these things about God, but God asked him to trust him for what is to come. All right? He asked him to trust him for what is to come, that Noah's faith was in the unseen promises of God that were to come in the future. That Noah's faith was in the unseen promises of God that were to come in the future. Yes, Noah had faith in past events. He had faith that God created the world. He had, he had seen uh, the, the, the work of God in the heart of his, of his family, of his line. I mean, he's got Enoch that said he walked with God. Noah also gets that tag as well, that he walked with God, that he was a man uh, of God, that he was blameless in his generation. He, so Noah exercised faith in past events but it motivated his faith into the hope that was to come, into the future events, the future promises that God had given to him. And so we do the same thing. If you're a Christian, what we do is we believe in past events. We believe in the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, which motivates us to have hope for the future. If we trust in the promises of God in the past, then it gives us confidence to trust in the promises of God in the future, namely that our eternity, our eternal home is in heaven, that we have the salvation of our souls and we have an eternity in heaven. So our, our faith is grounded in past events, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but it motivates us to walk in faith, to live by faith in the future promises of God. 
And Hebrews 11, 7, we'll dive back into it. It says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So how did Noah prove that his faith was true? He put his faith into action. He put his faith into action. James uh, says it this way in James chapter 1, verse 17. He says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And what Noah did was he expressed his faith through obedience to God's commands. And it actually says this multiple times uh, in the story of Noah uh, in the ark in Genesis in, in verses, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 22. It says that Noah did this, he did all that God commanded him. And in chapter 7, Genesis 7, 5, it says, And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. So it, it, it tells us that, that Noah was faithful and did all that the Lord commanded. He walked in obedience to God's command, that his faith was put into action. And when God said, Noah, uh, I'm sending a flood. I need you to build an ark. I need you to gather the animals, gather your family, and get them onto uh, the ark. Noah says, yes. That he puts his faith into action and begins to build, begins to work, begins to gather the animals, begins to get his family uh, onto the ark for when the flood would come. And notice that in this verse as well, in Hebrews eleven seven, 7, where it talks about Noah, that it mentions that he acted in reverent fear in building the ark and in doing all the things that God commanded him to do. Uh, what it means when it says he acted in reverent fear uh, is just simply that Noah submitted himself to the authority and the power and the faithfulness of God. That he submitted himself uh, under God's commands and under God's authority because he knew and he trusted that what God was telling him was true, number one, and, and it was good, and it would lead to good things uh, for him in the future. But here's the deal, is a lot of times putting our faith into action, because this is, this is real, putting our faith into action, taking that step of faith uh, and moving into action means that we don't know exactly what will happen in the future. But the simple yet hard call in our lives is to take that next step of faith. It sounds so simple, but yet it's a, I know it's a hard step to take that next step of faith when we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And um, actually, this, this happened for, for us uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, we went to the beach. We were at the pool. Uh, me and my son, my oldest, he's three, uh, and, and he loves to swim. So what we did pretty much uh, for about eight hours a day was swim. And I came out with a busted eardrum somehow. Um, he's fine. He's good to go. Now, he wants to get back in the pool. I'm thinking maybe never swim again uh, after going through that. But he, he loves swimming. So we're in the pool um, all day long. And he still wears a floaty. He's only three. But during this trip, we allowed him to take his floaty off in the shallow end. Um, and and because he could keep his head above the water, we allowed, to, allowed him to take his floaty off. Um, and let me just explain the excitement that's going on um, when a three-year-old gets to take the floaty off in the shallow end. Let me just try to try to explain this. It's like taking training wheels off a bike for the first time. You know, you're so excited. I got the freedom, get the training wheels off. It's like getting your learner's permit, uh, high schoolers, 15-year-olds, getting that learner's permit. Oh, I get to drive a car. And then, you know, you spend a year driving with your parents, and then you finally get the parental floaties off, and then you get to drive by yourself, right? Uh, going to college, that type of freedom, um, becoming an adult, getting married. I mean, you got all this freedom now. Well, this is what's going on in, in three-year-old Levi's mind. Is he's got the freedom to, do, to, to swim around. He's not, he's not held down by this, or I should say held up by this floaty. Um, he gets to now swim around. He can swim. He can't tread water if it's too deep, but he can swim. He can get to the wall. He can get to me. He can, kinda, he can stand up where he was. Uh, but he decided, I'm going to get a little bit, I, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go now. And he decided he wanted to jump off the side of the, uh, uh, of the pool into a little bit deeper water uh, where I was standing. And he said, Dad, can you stand over here? I'm going to jump to you. I'll swim to you. Um, and I said, okay, that's fine. We can do that because he, you know, he felt pretty confident. Well, he jumps off the, the, the side of the pool and we do this. We did this for hours. He jumps off the side of the pool, swims to me, jumps off the side of the pool, swims to me. And every time he jumped off, he jumped off the, the side, entered the water, his eyes closed the whole time, and he just swam. And he just swam and swam and swam until he got to me. And what I would say is that Levi, in a sense, was putting his faith into action. 
that he was able to look and see. Uh, but, but ultimately, when he jumped in the water, it was eyes closed. I don't know where dad is. I don't know what's going on. I assume he's out in front of me, uh, but I'm going to take this step, dive into the water, and I'm swimming. And here's the thing. If I'm not there, then he, then he just sinks, right? Um, because he can only swim for so long, only hold his breath for so long before he just sinks. And there was a couple times that he did just sink, and I had to run over there, you know, scoop him up and grab him, and he was good to go. But when he jumps into the pool, and he's swimming to me, eyes closed, not, not knowing where I am, he is, he is putting faith into action, not knowing exactly uh, what lies ahead, but, but trusting that I'll be there, Right? trusting that I'll be there. And the psalmist wrote of faith in this way uh, in Psalm 119, 105. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And here's the deal. Faith is us trusting that God holds the light that guides the steps on our path. It's not us seeing 10 miles ahead or 10 years ahead or five years ahead or even a year ahead. But it's, but it's us taking that next step. It's that lamp lighting our path one step at a time that we take in faithfulness to God. That we say, God, I trust that you got the next step. I trust that you're there. I'm following you. And I know that you'll be there um, to, to, to continue to guide me on the path. So maybe you're in a season where faith is required. Maybe it's uh, you're changing jobs or changing careers. Maybe it's you're going back to school or back to work, and there, you know there's just a lot of there's. I mean, there is faith that is required right now in doing a lot of things because just because uh, of the times that we're in. Uh, maybe it's parenting decisions, decisions you have to make uh, for the good of your child, or some some hard decisions that you have to make, or hard um, lessons you're trying to teach. Wh- whatever it is, um, I, I can find myself really in all three of these in some ways uh, over the last you know year of my life. And, and so maybe it's where do you need to take that next step of faith? Where do you need to put faith into action and to say, God, I'm trusting you with the next step. I know you're there, and I trust you with that next step. Where is it that you need to jump into the pool and swim to the Lord, in a sense, and know that he's there to catch you if you fall, if you sink, if you fall short, he's there to catch you. And the last point that that we make from this passage is that we can confidently put our faith into action because we serve a God who is faithful first. Because we serve a God who is faithful first. The last part of Hebrews eleven seven 7 says this. It says, by this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. It just simply means that Noah, when he stepped out, to build the ark, to gather his family, to uh, get the animals and and everything, to get everything ready, to get onto the ark, doing all that the Lord commanded him, as it says, that when he did this, he became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. That Noah put his faith into action because he trusted that God would be and is faithful, that he had seen it in past generations, and that he trusted that God would do it again in his own life that he trusted in, he put his faith in the unseen promises of God, that, that God would be with him, that he would guide him, that we, he would lead every step of the way, that God truly would be a lamp to his feet and a light to his path. And so we see in uh, Genesis, we see this faithfulness of God play out um, in his conversations with Noah. In Genesis six eighteen, God makes the promise to Noah. And this promise is that I will establish my covenant with you. And then in chapter 9, after the flood, after the flood happens and they're off the ark and, and the, uh, the, the flood has taken place and, and, and Noah's seen it all happen now, God comes back to Noah in Genesis 9, 9 and says, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. So six eighteen was, I will establish my covenant Genesis chapter 9, verse 9, which is a long stretch of time. I know it's three chapters, but it's a long stretch of time that happens. God returns and says, I establish my covenant with you. And then a few verses later, he solidifies the covenant with the symbol of the rainbow. He says, when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you. So God is faithful to Noah. And what he's saying when he says, I will establish my covenant with you, is is, God's just very simply saying, I am with you. That Noah, I am with you. 
When you jump into the, the water, not, well, not the flood, but the, the, back to the Levi's uh, illustration, when you jump into the pool and you're swimming along, I am there to, to, to be there. I'm there to be with you. I'm there to guide you. I'm there to direct you. And if you fall, if you fall short, I am faithful to rescue you from the, the water. I am faithful to lift you up because God is faithful first that we can trust God, we can rely on his faithfulness, we can have faith and put our faith into action because God is faithful first. I love how the writer of Hebrews kind of finishes the book. He's almost done in in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says this, we've talked about faith, we talked about uh, the faith of the people of the Bible, and then he gets to uh, chapter 13, verse 8, and he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he's saying there is if he was faithful before, He'll be faithful again. If he was faithful in my mountaintop times, he'll be faithful in the valleys. If he was faithful to provide here, he'll be faithful to provide there. If he's, if he's with me here, he's with me now, and he's with me always. That's the promise of God. Think about that. The promise of God is I am with you. That wherever you wrestle, where you struggle, where you fall short, I am with you. And that is a promise that we get to hold on to as the people of God. Is that, and, and, and here's the deal, too, is that God is not waiting on us to be faithful before he is faithful. Does that make sense? God is not waiting on our faithfulness before he is faithful. God is faithful first. And here's what I mean by that. We see this in the very beginning of Scripture. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, a few chapters back from uh, the story of Noah. You have Adam and Eve have sinned in the garden. And, and, and who is the, the one that God responds to and pronounces judgment to first? A lot of times we think it's God immediately pronounces judgment on the woman and the man. Um, no, it's actually God pronounces judgment on uh, the serpent first. And here's what he says to the serpent. And, and it, I, I love this picture too, is it's uh, the serpent is, 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 or I'm sorry, Adam and Eve are talking to God in the garden and, and he, Adam's blaming Eve for what happened, the sin that happened. Uh, Eve's, Eve's kind of, she's like, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Um, and then God, it's like he turns. It's like all of a sudden he goes, boom, and he turns and he looks at the serpent. And he says, he says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Before judgments were even given to, before uh, Adam and Eve could even, could even respond faithfully to God after they had sinned, God steps in the gap and says, I'm going to send a Savior. I'm going, to, I'm going to crush the head of the enemy, and I'm going to rescue you and redeem my people that God is faithful first. Before we can even move into faith or move into faithfulness to God, God is faithful to his promises. It is not our faithfulness that moves God to action. Romans 5, 8, even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The message of the gospel is that where we fall short, that Jesus is faithful in our place. And so we can have confidence to move our faith into action because we can trust that our God is going to be faithful to hold on to his promises, that we can put our faith in Jesus because we know that that what our future holds is the hope of eternity, is the hope of freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from hell, freedom from the grave. And we know that our life is held in eternity by God to be spent with him forever and ever. So we can put, we can have confidence in our faith because we have a God who is faithful first. He's shown this in Noah's life. He's shown this in Abraham's life. He showed this in, uh, in all the lives of the people. These, these uh, the, the ch- Hebrews chapter 11 talks about these people that acted by faith. And it was God who worked and acted faithfully first in all of their lives. And they are moved to uh, faith in action. And so for us, as the people of God, our call is to be moved to people of faith in action, to take that next step of faith, knowing that God holds us in his hand, knowing that God is faithful, that where we fall, where we, uh, where we sink um, as we swim to him, where we fall short, that he is there to scoop us up um, and to bring us the rest of the way because he is faithful. And we can rely on that tonight, that our call 
as the people of God, just like Noah, just like Abel, just like Enoch, who we've talked about the last few weeks, is to put our faith into action. And we can do this confidently, confidently because we have a God who is faithful first. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life.